So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to another classic map that we've seen time and time again as this submod has gone through all of its various iterations and that is of course Toll for Last. Toll for Last, one of my personal favourites. Um, it always has the... it's very rarely produced a battle that has proven to be unentertaining in my view and I'm sure that will continue to be the case here because it always produces large-scale battles for a start. They're always especially violent um, and we shall see how this one develops. It is of course, as is usually the case in Toll Falas, a 5v3 which is probably a good thing for the attackers. The attackers in a 5v3 often have the initial edge in a battle such as this but in a 4v3 I think Toll Falas is defensible enough, especially on that side of the river over there, that could become a little bit dicey for the attacks if they didn't have that extreme numbers advantage that they could have here. Of course this does mean the defenders are going to have that extra edge in terms of quality. It does look as though we're not going to see these outer farmsteads defended, but considering it's, again, that 5v3 does mean that it's very unlikely that the defenders are going to try and hold the outer farmlands because it's simply too open and the attackers will swallow them whole if they do so. So I can't blame them too much for that. But we'll go through the attacking armies first and foremost as they have made landfall here. Starting off with Stegri 4, who's going to be playing as Rudauer. Rudauer, a faction that I do like on the attack. Not so much for their traditional might, because obviously for the attacking teams you would expect that numerous and more heavily armoured factions that are able to take a real beating would be what you want, at least for the main body of your army, which Rudauer certainly aren't that. They don't really focus too much on defence. But they're one of the more ideal factions, I think, when it comes to supporting a general advance because of all the damage that they're capable of doing with units like this. The Franodyne Berserkers, they're throwing projectiles in general with the armor-piercing damage they can lay down, just high damage in general. Rudauer are a puzzle for the defenders to have to try and solve here because if you completely ignore projectile units like this, you're going to be in for a real world of hurt. But of course, if you use your ammunition on units like this, you may not be able to deal with the high numbers units that are elsewhere on the field. So a very good faction to have at your disposal if you're the attackers. Uh, Ferodrum Javelins are hidden here as well, which are another really dangerous projectile unit, if not more so at range than the Berserkers themselves because they've got a bit more ammunition, but they're also kind of fragile because they lack a shield. We of course have the Atanamor's Troll Hunters, which by Rudauer standards are pretty heavily armoured, so they're a little bit more resilient to the inevitable arrow fire that's going to be coming their way. The Witch Arm Enslavers are the best unit of melee, pure melee infantry that Rudauer can field. Once again, that armor-piercing focus um, it really shows through here. Granadine Pikemen, which are a little bit of an oddity in the Rudauer roster because that shield means that compared to their peers, pikes from other factions, are actually fairly resilient, both at range and in melee, to various forms of attack, which is not something you can say about the rest of the Rudauer roster relative to similar units, but uh, here they are, a very good unit to bring in this situation as well. Trollshaw Axe Throwers, of course, very dangerous for the defenders if they are left unheeded. Plenty of Rudar Clansmen with the armor upgrade, a good choice, because it means that they're going to be very resilient indeed. Big shield value on them as well, and actually more damaging than spears of a similar tier from uh, similar factions as well. So, all round a good choice to bring on the attack, but ultimately they're still basic spears in melee, so they're only going to be able to do so much. And speaking of basic units, Rudar Swordsmen here in large quantities which, again, they're not going to pull up any trees in terms of the quality that they offer, but something just fell off my desk, I'm not sure what that was. But yeah, Rudauer Swordsmen, when they're in these kinds of numbers, of course, the advantage to bring them is obvious. You're going to be able to keep up your assault for a very elongated period of time, which is going to be a very useful thing to have when there are five of your armies assaulting only three defenders. Moving on to Y2K 86's army, playing as Umbar, certainly a more... Well, certainly a heavier faction and more focused around their quality. Corsair infantry with the armour upgrade, not the worst idea in the world to send forward as an initial skirmishing party. If you want to open the battle with maybe taking your time a little bit more, then this is the kind of unit that can be very useful for you as Umbar. Speaking of which, the basic Belagai units can also offer you that kind of thing. Again, Belagai footmen are not too great in melee at dealing damage, so even less so than the Rudai plans we've already seen. But they're re they're relatively cheap, and as far as Umbar units goes, you're gonna you're gonna be spending a lot of money on your really quality infantry units. So you do need to pad out your numbers somehow. And the Belagai footmen, they're very basic as far as spears go, but they'll get the job done. Of course, our black guards, of course, another throwing projectile unit, something else for the defenders to be worried about. Of course, very very damaging, pretty decent in melee as well. All things considered, not their main focus, but they can hold their own, and that is the sort of margins by which battles have been won or lost in the past. Alcarondas Legion, big fan of this unit as I've said several times in the past, very nice heavy infantry unit, 
pretty much the antithesis of all that the Rudau units are in terms of really prioritizing that attack and at the expense of all else, including armor and melee defense, the Alcarondas Legion um, are very adept at keeping themselves alive whilst doing good damage with their swords. And then in behind them, Ardenheim Shield Guard, a unit of heavy Black Numenorean Spears, of course, this upper echelon of the Umbar roster is also where you will start to see uh, their really high morale come into effect, so they're much less likely to go running for the hills. And then at the back, some Naru Naru Sentinels as well, which... not the general? I don't believe. But still, really strong unit of pikes. Very similar, actually, to the Pranodyne pikes in the sense that they are the units of pikes in the game that have access to that shield. The Naru Naru Sentinels back that up with having that really heavy Numenorean plate armor as well, so... Most pikes, even the really strong units of pikes, actually have some sort of vulnerability to missiles from the front. That's not really the case with the Naru Naru Sentinels. Um, we also have a ballista over here, which could be a really useful thing to shoot over that river, which the defenders do so often like to post up a strong defense on. Then we move on to Hrothgar Heavenlight, who I... Did he send me this replay? I feel like Jen Mumu was the one who sent me this replay, actually. Unless they are one and the same person, um, in which case he must have changed his name on Discord um, a while back. We'll see if Jen Mumu shows up elsewhere in this roster, but Hrothgar's army... He's got some Nurad Footmen and Nurad Halberds, a classic frontline, not too dissimilar to the kind of thing you can expect to see from the Easterlings. Plenty of armour piercing. They don't have that extra range that a Pike Phalanx offers them, but as long as you don't come up against a really high quality frontline, as long as you're coming up against something armoured that doesn't have a plethora of Pikes to hold your arm's length, this can be a really difficult thing to deal with, especially when you consider the big shields on the Nurad Footmen, you can't even shoot them to death easily. Plenty of Nomadic Warriors in behind to help them out, which numbers wise that's really going to help the attackers once again. Very Ag Bowman with the armor upgrade are also going to really help in the skirmish fight, which to be fair, Umbar haven't brought a huge amount of skirmishers. Castamere's rangers are hidden, possibly Corsair crossbows as well, but not a ton of archers outside of those Corsair infantry and Naran Hara Raw Guard on the front line, so they will need to do some range at, or some damage at long range. Very Ag Warriors with the armor upgrade as well, basic as far as heavy swordsmen go, but they are the sort of thing that if they can get into melee without getting shot, which is questionable on, on a map like this, they can still be pretty efficient. The Calori Seekers, pretty much the only unit of what you could call fodder cavalry in the game. They're very, very cheap, which for a unit of high mobility troops like this can be considered a benefit in its own right, but don't expect them to do all that much. I mean, they can offer you a little bit of mass pushing ability if the line is already crumbling. Um, so they do have some utility, but if they're just thrown in unthinkingly, or if they have to intercept other cavalry, they're going to get mopped up pretty quickly. But even then, at least they're blocking a cavalry charge, of course. And then at the back, some Brotherhood units, Brotherhood of the Sword, Brotherhood of the Spear, and finally the very, very deadly Nurat Stormguard with that armor piercing and that they offer. Nomadic Warriors there. Now moving on to the two armies that will be attempting to cross the bridges over here and take the direct path to the settlement. Oh dear. That was a bit of a weird frame drop there, but we have Long Chong who's playing as the Orcs the Misty Mountains. Speaking of high numbers factions, the Misty Mountains will be very useful for that sort of thing. Heavy Goblin Crossbows. Crossbows are always going to be useful whether you're on the attack or the defense in a big siege like this because of that stopping power they have. Drake Broodlings, the great enigma really of the Misty Mountains roster. They can be incredibly useful if their mass can plow through a line very quickly and once they get up to speed they're very difficult to stop. But if they are stopped, they can fizzle out pretty quickly. So it'll be all in the micro there. Goblin King's Bodyguard, a safe enough place to put your general, which is of course where he is. White Uruk Fearmongers with plenty of heavy goblin halberds, so plenty of armor piercing phalanx units, so of course the White Uruk Fearmongers are the only ones with some genuine quality behind them, the rest fully dependent on that phalanx formation that they have to be effective. Goblin Archers also got some Mountain Uruk Coast in there, so some genuine heavy infantry in and amongst this huge amount of phalanx units. I'm actually getting into the Mordor army over there, but the I mean, that's a lot of Misty Mountains units that we're seeing in front of us. There could be some hidden units as well. The Misty Mountains does have access to a fair few of them, after all. But finally, as far as the attackers go, we have DF Mark, who's playing as Mordor. We've got some Orc Javelins, another good idea. Plenty of throwing projectiles on offer for the attackers here. A real something for the defenders to have to try and work out. He's also got some Orc Archers for that long range. Um, but again, the Orc Archers are not going to be too damaging at range. But the whole point is to try and wear the enemy down slowly with a unit like that. And Orc Javelins... Um, also present another target the defenders would probably rather not shoot with their archers if they could help it. Round and Halberd, so even more Halberdiers over here. Plenty of those units on display for the attackers here. Orc Fodder, Olag High for that uh, heavy duty unit of monstrous infantry. Sauron's Will, some Temple Inquisitors just in behind as well. 
couple, another unit of Sauron's will, plenty of armour piercing on display here, certainly Orc Maulers and a unit of Blackguard of Barad-dur ready to cross the bridge as well. Who will they be facing on the other side? Well, they will be facing Valkarion or Valsarion and his Arthurdain army, so all of that armour piercing will be very useful at dealing with the rank and file troops of Arthurdain. The Evandim Spearmen do have that armour upgrade, it won't save them from the sheer numbers and armour piercing the Mordor and the Misty Mountains are bringing, but it will offer them at least a shielded front line, which they can potentially support with other tools, which is what Arthane generally try to do anyway. Just in behind another unit of Evandim Spears, a couple of units of fully upgraded Arthane men arms, in fact several units of them. I mean, they're a good enough workhorse, but like I said, because of all the armour piercing and the sheer numbers that they're going to be facing off against, they're going to need something with a bit more oomph in terms of quality to really help them out. Fortunately, they have a really good position up here to shoot into the bridges, the Arthurday Marksmen. Again, they're a very basic unit of archers, but the position they occupy means they should still get a very high amount of kills, as should the Trebuchet, if Arcarion can choose the right moment to use it. If he gets too, uh, if he's got an itchy trigger finger, then he could use it too quickly and ultimately waste too much of his ammunition. We've seen that be the downfall of many a defender in the past. Arthurday Marksmen are also here. Got some Anuminous Gate Guards, Wardens of the North with those armor-piercing arrows, another unit of marksmen setting up with some stakes over there, which is fair enough, but if cavalry is still alive by that point, I'd be very surprised, given that there's only the Glory Seekers. Arthurdain Pikemen, two units of them, two not, not too surprising either to see units such as that. Dismounted Knights of Anuminous and some dismounted Fornost to Rhine Knights as well. And this isn't the entirety of the Arthurdain army, I would uh, hazard a guess that Rangers and Troll Slayers are also going to be present, which is going to be very necessary, I think, for Arthane to hold the line against a force that scary that is a raid against them. Now then, moving on to the Dwarves of Erebor. This is Jen Mumu, so here he is. He's going to be playing as one of the, one of the defenders, the Dwarves, no less. Very useful faction to have on the defense, of course, because few factions can hold a line quite so effectively as the Dwarves. Ironfoot Warriors are here with that armor upgrade, a very effective unit of frontline fighters. Certainly more so than the Arthurdain Manor Arms, not to disparage the Arthurdain Manor Arms, but this is a, the Dwarves are obviously much more suited for this kind of warfare. The Erebor Legionaries, of course, are just the upper tier version of that very effective unit of line infantry for their cost. Ironfoot Spears will offer that to formation as well, that's shield wall formation which can be useful for holding the line. Axe Guard of Erebor, armor piercing will be useful for the defenders as well, we've already spoken about how the attackers are going to be employing it, um, and that will be useful against Erebor themselves as well, but... Going the other way, it's really only Rudaur and, to a certain extent, Canned that don't really rely on armour as much to keep themselves alive. And even in those two cases, it's it's not even as if they've got really high melee defences to make up for that. So something like the Axe Guard of Erebor will be effective against everything that's coming against them, really. Ironfoot Pikes to help hold the line, and then we'll be getting into some of the really... the, the real killing machines that the Dwarves are going to be bringing. Two units of armour-piercing bodyguards, the Sons of Durin with their two-handers, and the Dragon Slayers of Arid Mithrin with their axe and shield. The Ironfoot Crossbows, which if they can get into a good position in a map on a map like this, they should be supremely effective. Ironfoot Axe Throwers, of course, we've already seen some Troll Shore Axe Throwers on the other side. They could be really, really good. Again, positioning is going to be everything, especially for them, because the Crossbows have got slightly better range, so the Axe Throwers will need to get a little bit closer to the action. And then, of course, probably the single most devastating unit we've seen on the field so far in the Blacklock Engineers, but once again, can they get into the right position for their body piercing and armor piercing bolts to get maximum effectiveness? We shall see. And finally, last but by no means least over here, Diego Rio Ramos is playing as Imladris. He's got all of his units in a great big blob, so we'll just try and pick out what we can. He has got some archers of Rivendell with the armor upgrade, obviously. Imladris are the least archer-centric of all of the elven factions, but that's not to say they've got a bad archer lineup by any means. They can still do a lot of damage. Um, they've got some Imladris sentries in there, which as far as pikes go on the field, in terms of being in melee, it's the most effective unit of pikes that we've seen. The Naran Ara Sentinels probably are better defensively because of that shield value, but the sentries, when it gets down to brass tacks in melee, will be superior. Swords of Rivendell are there with the armor upgrade as well. We've got some Elder Renway. Also in the mix, plenty of the basic units, which will help pad the army out, but they are going to need that quality as well. The upgraded Imladris Guardians will certainly go for that. Supremely strong unit of line infantry. He's gone for the Gwaith E. Rockdor, so this is a unit of defensive lance knights. If they can be used effectively, then they could be one of the units which causes a defensive victory, but it really does depend on how they're utilised. I mean, like I said, the Glory Seekers can get in their way, but there's scarcely a bigger gap in terms of quality between two mounted units. 
Um, but they do need to be careful about all of the throwing projectiles, armor piercing, weaponry, pikes and halberds and the like of the attacking infantry. It might be a reason to try and use the cavalry a bit later, but of course if you do that, you need to be at least in the game by the late game, which sometimes the attackers can start to pull away by the time that's the case. So again, it's a judgment call. Noritino warriors are in here. More Elder Enway this time. It's the spears. There's also some Elder Enway archers in there. The Gwaithi Myrdain. The Warhammers are on foot. And Arthan. So yeah, plenty of quality here, which is good to see. Obviously, if you're playing as the High Elves and you have the funds to spend, you may as well spend them on something good. That's exactly what Diego has done here. So, I think I'll make a bit of a cut because I believe, as is usually the case, they will give the defenders a chance to at least get fairly close to one another so they can put on a unified defence against the horde that is approaching them. Uh, but yeah, we shall see. I'll make a cut and we'll rejoin when the battle is beginning. So here we go, finally getting underway, and as you can see, there was a fairly hefty grace period involved in this one, which I'm not entirely in favour of. I've made my feelings on this clear in the past, I think, but certainly there was an opportunity, I think, for the attackers to maybe even, based on the pathfinding, the defenders decided to take cross the bridges before the defenders actually got into position crossing over this hill here, which would have made the battle, I think, a lot more interesting. And even on a smaller scale, this unit of Gwaithi Rockdor was left behind, and you can tell that the defenders were pulling rank on the attackers a little bit and told them to allow the cavalry back into defensive shape, which again, if I was on the attacker, attacking team, I probably would not have done, because if you're going to do that, then you should move your cavalry first, shouldn't you? There shouldn't really be this uh, accommodation, I think. And admittedly, while it is a 5v3 and the defenders need all the help they can get, Ultimately, I, I always feel like the motivation behind this sort of thing is so the defenders can sit in a singular position, get their archers in place, and watch the numbers get bigger in terms of their kill counts. That's Maybe I'm being a little bit too cynical, but that's always the first thing that comes to mind whenever this sort of grace period unfolds the way that it does. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, and we will be getting into what I hope will be an interesting battle replay and moving forward. Now, there are some Swords of Rimdale here on the front line from Lagris, but things are a little bit more spread out, maybe as a result of them trying to take cover from any attacking skirmishes. We've already seen those units of Corsair Infantry do a little bit of damage to the defenders. Um, against the lighter Imladris units, they'll do decently enough, even though the Swords of Rivendell do have that armour upgrade, shields pointing in the right direction as well. And in this sort of fight, as long as they can actually get themselves into a denser formation than this, they were in loose formation initially after all, as long as they can get into a straight up fight with either one of the Balagaya Footmen or the Rudar Swordsman, they'll be just fine. But that wasn't the best organisation that from the defenders either. And now as a result of them bunching their units back up, the unit is getting smaller and more compact. But it's also leaving massive gaps on the outside. And the Archers of Rimdal are now exposed to the Rudar Swordsman move. What I like this from the attackers though, that's aggressive. It shows that they're paying attention to what the defending units are actually doing. And now the men of Rudar are going to be able to swamp forwards. And at the very least, what they're going to be able to do is overrun that initial unit of Swords of Rivendell fairly efficiently. And every unit, as I said, is going to be important for the defenders here. So even losing that one unit for not a great deal of gain early on, I think, is going to be fairly important. Their armor upgrade won't save them from that. Now, they are getting some Imladris sentries into position now to try and shore up the line. But even they aren't in a particularly organized fashion. I mean, they will, of course, make a mockery of Rudauer Swordsmen in melee, but they are also fairly exposed, so if there are archers or even Rudauer Javelins that are capable of getting into position, this would be the ideal time to use them, another unit of those Swords of Rivendell getting into place. Now, generally speaking, the Swords of Rivendell should be, when they're not being exposed on their flanks, a very effective unit in this kind of fight. Rudauer Swordsmen are not really going to enjoy going up against a unit that's going to be capable of chucking out the kind of damage that the Swords of Rivendell are, and that armour upgrade is only going to make them more difficult to deal with in terms of these more basic units, but I really do like how aggressive Rudar are being. Hopefully, you can see here that Umbar are the ones that are primarily giving them a little bit of support with their Corsair infantry. Looking like we might have, yeah, Archers of Rivendell firing in, firing down onto the low ground there. Very Ag Bowman from Cannes also getting involved. So yeah, Imladris are going to need to stabilise themselves a little bit here if they are to have much success moving forward. Balagai Footman coming in, offering a little bit more of a defensive, a little bit more of a solid unit in addition to the glut of Rudar Swordsmen that have been committed forward. Arrows being looped over the top, Noritino Warriors, Swords of Rimdale, and of course the Imladris Sentries, but when the arrows are that far apart and not really 
getting the kind of angles that they will want. Um, you're not going to be doing the damage to the amount of sentries that maybe you would like to be. This is something that I like as well from Hrothgar. He is actually moving across the bridges. Time and time again on Tolflas, just because of the pathfinding on Medieval 2's bridges being what it is, we see people electing not to use them until this defence here is already crumbling, by which point it's really just another way of transiting into the fight which is happening in the settlement. But uh, Hrothgar looks like he might move forward as is. What I'm a little bit surprised about is how compartmentalised this assault seems to be. You can see that there are all of Jan Mumu's Erebor Dwarves down here, which don't seem to be doing all that much. And if you're intent on defending this hill, as we very often see on Tolflas, I'm very surprised that there aren't more Dwarven units up here initially, because a portion of the Imladris army is going to have to deal with a great deal of pressure right away. And you can tell here that the attackers smell blood because they're continuing to pour units forward. Now that Corsair Infantry is out of ammunition, they are coming forward as well, and the sheer numbers are going to be enough here to overwhelm more of the Swords of Rivendell. Like, they're a very effective unit in terms of their finesse and in terms of what sort of damage they're capable of doing to similar tiers of unit. But they're also fairly lightweight as far as Elven units go. So if you do overrun them like this, their potential efficiency decreases a lot. Now the Imladris Guardians are a little bit more of a different proposition, a much heavier unit. It's going to be more difficult for the attackers to overwhelm them, but if it's only one unit of reinforcements at a time, that could still be the sort of thing which does come into play. Meanwhile, over here, occupying this middle island, we do have the Orcish contingent of the attackers, the Misty Mountains and Mordor, getting ready to attack into the human portion of the defence over here from Arthurday, uh, but not yet ready to commit in earnest to this choke point, especially given Arthurday have got their artillery in a rather menacing position, also some Dwarven crossbowmen moving over here as well, but uh, I'm sure we shall be seeing that sooner rather than later. Well, we are now seeing some Erebor units get up here and reinforce the Elven line. Similar tier of line infantry as well to the Amladris Guardians and the Erebor Legionaries. In typical Dwarven fashion, a little bit more focused around armour. Being that solid block of metal that the Dwarves do tend to be. Still plenty of Rudau units on the front line. Over here, meanwhile, Amladris sentries holding the line nicely. Their formation not being buckled so far, which is a bad sign for the Belagaya footmen and Rugar swordsmen that are facing off against them. They are going to have to... I mean, I would say that Rudar javelins in particular, this would be an excellent opportunity maybe to use a unit of Trollshaw axe throwers to do some severe damage to the Elven Pikes, a very clear building block of their defence, but as it is, they're just sending forward more makeshift line in between the Corsair Infantry to keep this attack going, which is all well and good, but you're not going to be making too much in the way of progress with those Elven Pikes stood in the way as they are. Well, nomadic Warriors are over there. No missiles are forthcoming yet down there by the looks of things, but that's not terrible. Actually, no, there are. And maybe this is the idea from Rothgar. Seeing the opportunity to maybe run the arable supply of crossbow bolts dry a little bit, and I think Jen Moon who sees that's what he's trying to do, because it's only nomadic infantry that are on the bridges down there. Not the sort of unit that the dwarves need to rely on crossbow bolts to thin out before they engage in melee. Their infantry is going to be far superior to the entry level of Candish troops. There are some very ag bowmen moving onto the bridge as well to potentially counter skirmish, which is maybe a bit of a problem for arable. Yes, they can withstand that kind of arrow fire all day long, but they can't really respond to it without using valuable crossbow bolts. And that most certainly is not what they're going to want to be doing. Kind of ceased for the time being. Probing, but not yet moving forward. Ooh. And there you can see on the low ground there the Umbar Ballista shooting right through this defensive position. A good opportunity to be really, really efficient, maybe, against very valuable units of line infantry from the Dwarves and the Elves. Primarily going to hit Erebor Legionaries there, but. It's exactly the sort of support that the attacking infantry units are going to need if they're going to be effective. Meanwhile, Black Mark Engineers are firing again. I'm not really certain that now is the right time in the battle to be using a resource as valuable as the Black Locks. They are really, in terms of damage potential, the most fearsome unit on the field. So I wouldn't really be using them for now, considering that you're just fine on the front line already, and the only way that you won't be is from the Ballista, and you can't reach them. What? Upgraded Archers of Rivendell. Trading back and forth with those Archers on the low ground, but it's not really going to end too well for them, both in terms of efficient Archers like the Nomadic Infantry. Too cheap to really 
be considered a good target. And then the Nairun Arrow Raw Guard is just going to be straight up better in that. In those matches where you trade Arrow Fire with one another, their heavy armor doing all of the heavy lifting. We know our clans are moving forward to keep this assault going once again. Armor upgraded, reasonably solid unit, but you can see the difference in terms of quality here. And the initial good work that the attackers have done is starting to fizzle out a little bit now that the defenders are able to lean on their quality infantry units a little bit more. And I think they need to get more supporting units further forward. I mean, the Trollsher Axel is right there. If Stegbury were to put a unit here, like I said, the Pikes would be first port of call because they're unshielded. Maybe he's worried about them getting shot up, but I mean, you're the attackers. You've got manpower to spare. You need to try and force the defender's hand in some respects. Well, Mountain Eric Host and Orc Fodder crossing the bridges, not in high enough numbers to draw the attention of the Arthane archers or artillery for the time being. But also, when these units cross the river, will they really have reinforcements close enough by? Arthane could move forward and squash the entire assault pretty quickly. Well, they are now moving forward. These armor upgraded Variag Bowmen could prove to be a real annoyance for the dwarves here. They're going to march a little bit further forward, I think. They're going to try and go after unshielded dwarven units, if I had to guess. And yeah, they're going after the Ironfoot Pikes. You can see that several of them are already dying off. They still have that dwarven armor, but being unshielded as they are, certainly capable of doing a good amount of damage. And stuff like the Elder Inway Swordmasters, maybe less so with the Gwaithi Mirdane because of their second hit point, but still. This is a problem, actually, for the defenders. Hothgar being antagonizing with that one unit of very ad moment. They may need to respond to it with a unit of infantry counterattacking across the bridge. But in so doing, they can also kickstart a full-scale Candish assault across those bridges. But it's better than just having important units of yours whittled down with no real response. But again, I do like the fact that the attackers are almost goading the defenders into certain fights and taking certain actions, which maybe they're not comfortable with taking, given the fact that the defenders were afforded that courtesy before the game started at that grace period, I do like the fact that the attackers are still trying to draw them out of position a little bit more. Alcarondas Legion moving forward, but even they, much more high quality unit, but the problem here is not so much that, it's that they're still being kept at arm's length by the Imladris sentries, they're shuffling into a different position now though, so it might be a little bit more of a problem. Elder Runway archers firing from on high, doing some pretty decent damage to the infantry as it edges its way forward. I mean, there is an opportunity here to try and push your way through that gap that the pikes have now left. And the Noritino warriors are ready and waiting, but even still, Erebor legionaries pulling off the front line now, which is a little bit of a mistake, I think. The Amladris guardians are not entirely healthy anymore, and it, I mean, yes, the Rudar clans are obviously losing fairly heftily, but you're going to need... to keep up this defense. I mean, uh, Trollshaw axe throwers, that may be why. You can tell that they're immediately under Elven Arrow Fire and the Trollshaw axe throwers don't do so well when they are exposed like that. Continuing to take those ballista bolts as well. A little bit of friendly fire. Ranged units trading back and forth with one another. Well, Beriag Bowman getting closer. They're now close enough to the point where that unit of Ironfoot Warriors will be sorely tempted to try and engage them in melee done pretty well for themselves already so far. Are they going to pull back? Yes, they are. Good stuff. Now then, we are seeing the first engagements here between Arthurdain and the Orcish factions that are involved today. Some Orc archers shooting the Arthurdain man at arms in behind. Evan Dim Spearman of Valkarion engaging here with Long Chong's Mountain Uruks, but the Mountain Uruk host will easily be able to defeat what is the Militia Spears of Arnold. Mountain Uruk host, a very accomplished unit of Orc line infantry. Having them spearmen not going to be able to match that at all. Trying to go after the, the javelins here, but Arthane have been pulled out of position and this is not a particularly great engagement for Arthane to have taken. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Coming forward with some Arthane men at arms now as well. Yeah, this isn't going to be sufficient and this, I was worried actually that the Orcish assault here wouldn't have reinforcements to move forward, but as it is with the Orc archers, the javelins, it's a fairly efficient engagement, this. The saving grace for Arthurdain is their archers up on the hilltop, which means they may very well win this, but it won't be as efficient as it could have been for the human defenders. And efficiency is the name of the game in a 3v5. These sort of decisions can add up to count against you in the end. Fully upgraded Arthurdain men at arms. I mean, yes, the Orc fodder and the Marano infantry will be outclassed by the Arthurdain 
forces now that the Arthur Man on are on the front line, but still the single strongest unit of melee combatants that are over here in the section of the field are the Mountain Uruk Host. They're still trying to push their way through here, the Abendim Spearmen. They're not actually taking as much damage as I would initially thought. That armor upgrade definitely uh, earning its keep. And they're really trying to push through the Orcs here. I mean, they're going to be taking losses from doing this after game, but they're clearly eager to try and make it so that this Orcish Assault isn't as efficient as Mark may want it to be with these skirmishes in position. I mean, the Orc Archer is obviously going to get killed in droves by a unit of dedicated line infantry. Yeah, the Orc Archer is naturally a very poor melee combatant. Orc Maulers are crossing the bridge now as well, though. I mean, they're obviously going to be very vulnerable to missile fire, and Arthur Dane are immediately taking advantage of that from their archers up on the hilltop. Which is even just basic Arthur Dane marksmen will be enough to do the business there. Trebuchet. And those were hideous misses. Snow trolls are moving across, so the assault is well and truly underway. Goblin Archer is going to get into position to try and support. Is a little bit broken up from the attacks in the end. I feel like the idea they've had has changed as it's gone along, and that has been a result, I think, of Arthur Dane's extreme aggression in getting to those skirmishes. So both sides perhaps a little bit uh, guilty of hoping the fight would go one way and then it not transpiring the way they would have wanted. What on earth is going on here? Why are all these units knocked over? Because the bridge took damage? Surely not. That was a little bit bizarre. Well, I mean, they got hit by the trebuchet, but none of them die. In come the snow trolls. Extremely fast, so they're going to be able to reinforce fairly quickly. Mountain at Coast are shaken as a result of more units arriving and them getting overrun. It's still there. The starting skirmishes are routing. I mean, this unit of Arthur A. Man at Arms is almost certainly going to route as well now that they're in melee with an armor piercing infantry unit, and the trolls are here. Certainly against the trolls, they're not going to be up to all that much. The remainder of the Mountain Oryx also surrounding them, so... It's been a bit of a weird fight, this. Neither side has gotten exactly what they wanted. Both sides have taken damage, but... Overall, you'd have to say, I think the attackers will be the happier of the two over here. Purely because Arthur Day need the fight to be a lot cleaner than this, if they are to, uh... If they are to go on and be successful, I think. And they're sending more reinforcements out, which I'm not entirely sure is the right call. Meanwhile... Pushing back with some Elder Enway spearmen now, so this fight has been completely unmoving since the last time we saw it. The Imladra sentries still on the front line. They're a little bit more depleted now. Perhaps this has come about as a result of missiles hitting them. Rudar swords. I mean, nomadic infantry are on the front line. Out of ammunition with their arrows, make for a decent unit of makeshift line infantry as well. But you need a little bit more than makeshift when you're dealing with an Elven front line if you're going to have much in the way of success. Terrible Legionaries returns to the front line alongside the Elder and the Ladrus Guardians have taken a fair amount of attrition over time, but certainly much more casualties have been inflicted onto the attackers. Not many Rudar Swordsmen remain, so they're going to need more units on the way forward. Ardenai and Shield Guard, that's a little bit more like it. Heavy Spearmen, kind of similar to the Elder Enway in many ways, albeit the Elves will be better at dealing damage, certainly. Ardenai and Shield Guard, almost a purely defensive unit. Meanwhile, nomadic infantry still they are going about their business in this way, canned, and there really is no losing for this, because even if you can see here, the nomadic infantry clearly have had some counterfire courtesy of the Ironfoot crossbows, but it means there's going to be less crossbow bolts later on. Nomadic infantry aren't a an extremely cheap unit, in all fairness, but uh, yeah, nomadic infantry shooting into the backs of the Axe Guard of Erebor, trying to do what damage they can, soften the dwarves up as best they can with archers. I mean, that is the saving grace, I suppose, for the defenders as well. The fact that it is the dwarves that are having to deal with this sort of pressure. Um, they're going to be able to mitigate basic arrow fire better than most other factions in the game. Even in Maladris. Maladris may have the armor, but really... You have a small army, generally speaking, so you really don't want to be taking any losses at all to such tomfoolery. Yeah, this isn't looking good for the... Uh, I mean, the Ardenheim Shield Guard are a locked morale unit, so if they do get friendly fire from that ballista, it won't cause them to rout. And the ballista could also be just the thing for dislodging this unit of Elder Renway. The elves may be pushing a little bit too far down the hill, maybe get a little bit closer to the pillars again, 
reform the line, but you can't really disengage at this point with the Argent Iron Shield Guard, I suppose. More infantry will be needed. Alcarondas Legion pushing forward, another unit of Imladris Guardians. I think Imladris have recovered fairly well in terms of the kills they've been able to inflict upon the enemy. Something that is always very difficult to keep track of, of course, is how efficiently you're, they're using their ammunition. They have been using arrows this whole time. The Elven War Cry is going up every now and then. Looks like they just ran out of ammunition this unit of Elder Runway Archers, but I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. Let's go and have a look and see what Arthurdain are doing with the reinforcements they've sent forward, including pikes. I mean, it looks like the Snow Trolls are on their last legs. And uh, finally, they will be laid low by the Arthurdain Man Arms. But the Olag High are also forward now as well. Neither of these two units in melee are going to be all that great against Olag High. Neither of them really are going to be all that good in close quarters against something like the Sauron's Will either, although they're already shaken. Mountain are at Coaster here. Surely these Evendim Spearmen are not going to last too much longer under this kind of pressure. It's up here. They are starting to utilise... I noticed the black projectiles, yes, the Wardens of the North, armour-piercing arrows using the steel bows of the Dunedain. Also the regular bows of the Arthurian Marksmen. There are these iron foot crossbows up here as well so it is this ranged support which is making this fight still quite costly for the orcs whether it's costly enough i don't know they're clearly keen after they on keeping the orcs out here though so they can continue to use this vantage point and pick their targets as they wish because they continue to send reinforcements out here and they're essentially sending these infantry units to eventually die another unit of after man at arms snaga skirmishes are a little bit exposed as are goblin archers and orc archers. and there's plenty of squishy ranged units, I suppose, here, which the Arthane Marksmen can take advantage of, although Temple Inquisitors are here to maybe ruin that particular plan as well. It wasn't a charge, though, they just bumped into melee. They are shaken. I really hope those Wardens of the North are not shooting at Snaga Skirmishers. That would be an incredible waste. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because those iron, iron steel bow projectiles are landing all over the place. Black Numenorians with their two-handed blades. And at this point, I really don't know. They're still sending reinforcements forward here, our Arthur Day. I feel like if this had been a little bit more well-organized, this could have worked out really nicely, but it has been very disjointed from Valkyrie. I mean, you may end up paying the price for that in the end because he's hemorrhaging manpower, and the Orcs are going to be able to withstand this kind of mosh pit much more easily than a faction of humans, as you can see here. Dunedain Troll Slayers immediately under fire from both the basic archers and javelin men that they're facing off against. This amount of Fornost to Rhine Knights are maybe a little bit more of a problematic unit for the Orcs to try and face. This troll, meanwhile, is in here. Still getting in and amongst the Arthurdain Pikes. There's still more units arriving in the background of well, another unit of Sauron's Will. There's still units on the far side as well, so plenty for the Orcs to still commit. Speaking of which, Canned are still doing their thing here on the bridge, and they are also ready to attack forward when need be. I mean, not with anything too deadly, nomadic warriors, infantry, and just some very ag bowmen, but as soon as they do cross here, they'll be able to attack quickly. Get something across these bridges to engage once it looks as though the defence up here on the hill is starting to falter, albeit I do think that the attacks are going to have to be a little bit more aggressive up here on the hill if they do hope to try and start pushing them back. I mean, Nomadic Footman, or Neuro Footman I should say, and some Alcarondas Legion, Archers Ribbon down moving in, but yeah, with the Dwarven Axemen in here, more Elven Infantry, they're not going to make any headway like this. And they're in danger here of just being ground to death on the sheer quality that the dwarves and elves can bring to the table. That is the god Helene firing away. Going after the Ettenmore's troll hunters is another very worthwhile target to try and kill off. If you can take away Rudauer's throwing projectiles, you take away a decent amount of the damage that they are capable of delivering. Over here, still, still some of the centuries over here. Only 13 of them, but. They've had a long shelf life in this battle and they've definitely contributed to their team, but this is where maybe the attackers can start to gain a bit of ground. You can see that the side of this buckling a little bit with Nurad Footman using their war picks to 
hack through these elves and potentially is there to crunch in from the side now. The only problem is the Gwaith Yarthand are right there to shore up the line once again. How long can Imladris keep this up for though? The attackers still have plenty more reinforcements they can commit forward. It's not quite the veritable horde that it once was, but still. Whitey Rockdor thought about charging him, but it wasn't really all that effective, so I think they're going to have to recycle themselves and come back for another go when it's a little bit clearer. Noritino Warriors being committed to melee, of course, this is the reason why you would bring them, so that when they are out of ammunition, they can contribute a little bit more readily than the Archers of Rivendell in melee. So this is where they can really earn their pay. Meanwhile, what is going on here? There are Snaga routing. I was going to say, maybe the enemy did push through. I mean, they do have that unit of cavalry after all, but are they forming up another line? Looks as though, actually, the orcs routed in the face of this, which is a little bit interesting. I mean, that was a really nasty hit there on the Blackguard of Baradur. Mark losing his bottle as a result of that. He is going to retreat with them now. Orc javelins getting into place. Going to try and chip away at these forces. Arthur Day Marksman taking a full frontal volley from the Javelins, but they won't mind too much about that. Arthur Day Marksman not the most important unit. It's been a very weird attack, this. Morale of the Orcs completely collapsing. I mean, it's been a chaotic fight, which usually favours the attackers, but maybe what I said has come to pass, and too many of the Orcish reinforcements were too far away to actually react when things did go south. Now the only thing that's... Well, the only unit that is intended to be in melee that's over here is the Heavy Goblin Halberdiers. Yes, armor piercing, yes, a phalanx, but their formation is going to be buckled, and when the troll slayers get hold of them in close quarters, they are going to fall apart incredibly quickly. They're trying to reorganize themselves, but surely they're going to end up routing here. Most unfortunate. This is good for Arthurdane, though. I don't know whether they're going to have the manpower to withstand another assault, but at the very least, they're going to force the orcs into taking way more damage than they otherwise would have done. Orc Javelin's running away in the face of those Arthur marksmen, but we'll keep tabs on that. Well, Cam, still waiting, still biding their time. The dwarves are still ready to deal with this little Kanish incursion when it does decide to cross the bridges, but at this point the epicenter of the battle, as it usually is on Tolkolas, is at the top of these at the top of this hill on these ruins. The other unit of Imladris sentries now moving forward, so I mean Imladris by the late game probably aren't going to have all that much left they committed so much to holding onto this hill. Quite the Arthan moving forward with the Noritono warriors now, so the forward momentum of the Nurad footmen and these Rudai clans we've had is now well and truly ended. Those heavy elven spears will hold on for a long time, even the armour piercing of the footman is not really going to be enough to impact the Gwaith Yartha, and truly one of the most difficult units to kill off quickly in the game, incredibly tanky. Elsewhere, trying to get some troll hunters into position, I mean this is perhaps what they should have done a little bit earlier, Rudauer, utilising stuff like their javelins, I mean, I mean they're shooting through the ruins, going after Sons of Durin, Elder and Race Swordmasters, they really need to be doing damage to these front lines though. Larger concentrations of units, forward comes some Variag Warriors and Neural Halberd, so can send forward another wave. Wave after wave of assault here. Eventually when the defenders do run their ammunition supply dry, this could be a little bit more of a concern. All the runway archers. Goblin Halberds unsurprisingly are routing, and this will give Arthur Dane the opportunity to reform their defensive position. Got their archers still, don't know how much ammunition they have per se, or how much ammunition they have left in their artillery. Arthur Dane marks them coming forward, they still have their dismounted Knights of Numinous, which can be used as a nice linchpin for their defence. Well, on the other side over here, still have Blackguard of Baron, but they still have plenty of heavy goblins as well, so numbers isn't necessarily going to be an issue. Two units of Blackguard of Baradur pushing forward at the same time could cause havoc for the defence, but do they have the army around the Blackguard at this point to really make that stick? I mean, just about, but I feel like at this point, actually, they need to attack with everything they have over here, the Orcs, and that would be that would be the answer. And looking like with some Nurad footmen getting onto the bridges, Kand might be preparing for an assault down here against Erebor as well, with more and more of these Dwarven units, including some Legionaries and Gwaiti Mirdang, another Elven unit, being pushed up to the top of the hill to try and hold on against this assault. 
maybe that is the intention. Brotherhood of the Spear and Veriag Warriors coming in here now as well. Decent quality units, Veriag Warriors basic as far as the heavy swordsmen go, but Brotherhood of the Spear very solid as a spearman, but they're still going to be out bustled here by the dwarves and the elves. That is going to be a continuous problem, and Wall's Troll Hunters still trying to do their thing. We have clansmen, Ferrochum Javelins moving forward. Do they have much more in the way of infantry? Y2K maybe needs to start thinking about sending forward more of what he has. Alcarondas Legion might be the answer. Even desperation settings for Rudar Axemen. They're not going to do all that well under arrow fire, but needs must, I think. And now, Kandar moving forward. This is a bit of a bold move. I mean, nomadic warriors are moving in. The Ironfoot Spears and Warriors will be able to defeat them fairly handily in melee, but... There may very well be panic settings at this point for the Dwarves. Neurad Footman, Nomadic Infantry just in behind them. I mean, Neurad Footman and Ironfoot Warriors are actually a fairly, fairly interesting match. Warriors are probably better in terms of quality. The Armour Piercing would be the great leveller, but then another thing which is acting against the Neurads. Maybe crossbows up on that hilltop over there. More units floating across. Two units of Nomadic Warriors backed up by a unit of Neurad Footman, so... I mean, in terms of sheer quality, the Dwarves should still be fine here, but now they're going to have to fight on multiple fronts, which maybe they weren't expecting to have to do for now. Maybe they're going to try and get in behind enemy lines with those nomadic warriors. I mean, this is where this cavalry can really start to pay dividends. These nomadic warriors are going to get in the way. It wasn't the best charge into the nomadic warriors either from the rock door. Maybe he didn't target them, he was hoping to charge into the back there, but I think Rockdor taking some damage. Going to need some more units over here to support this assault. Umbar caught a little bit flat-footed, perhaps. Of course, our Blackguards need to get across these bridges and assist this Candish assault, otherwise it's going to fall apart as quickly as it began. And that's not the sort of thing which the attackers can really afford at this stage in proceedings. Damage being done. These nomadic warriors are surely going to rout in the face of this elven pressure. Blackguards are moving across now. Is it going to be quick enough? I don't know. Yeah, these are and they're almost completely gone. Even if they don't end up routing at this point, they're going to end up simply dying in the face of the dwarven assault. It was a pretty decent idea. I think it just needed more units, more high quality units, and some support. So the black guards needed to be a little bit quicker on the draw. Maybe the storm guard would have just been shot up by the crossbows though. So it's a it's a difficult one. Downhill charge from the rock door. Yeah, they just sort of bump through the nomadic warriors. I mean, they absolutely rip them apart with their swords, not their lances. But it is what it is. Frodrum javelins in position. They're going to be trying to do damage. I mean, it's not gone as well as I thought it might early on for the attackers over here. The elves and the dwarves together with their quality have just been really dominant on this front line and also maybe not the attacks maybe haven't been big enough I think the main key actually however is the fact that support like this from the Ferodrum Javelins that they're offering now shooting at point blank into the Gwaith the Arthand has been in too short a supply for the attackers up to this point they really do need to start doing a little bit more of that if they are to be successful Rodham Javelins, of course, are perfectly capable of looking after themselves in melee as well, so their presence on the front line will be appreciated, I'm sure. Still the Gwaith Yarth and the Lynchpin, the Elder Enway Swordmasters as well, showing some good quality. Upper on Dust Legion, while the Dwarves bursting forward, Erebor Legionaries doing their thing. They are a little bit exposed, perhaps, to the Ballista on the low ground, which has been doing some decent damage, but it's not been utterly devastating. The angle is a little bit difficult for the Ballista to be as effective as perhaps the attackers wanted it to be. It's still been a worthwhile addition but it's not been the sort of thing they've been able to lean on to really allow them to make that progress that they need. And at this point, yeah, Elves moving forward. More Noratino warriors going to join the action to try and help cement the progress that they're making over here. They've still got the Gwaithi Mirodane they can potentially commit forward. More units, meanwhile, over here, Corsair Blackguards, I don't know if they've used up their ammunition, probably, possibly, because these Sons of Durin look incredibly damaged. Maybe that was a result of the Corsair Blackguards 
doing their thing. I mean, the Corsair Blackguards can't afford to just sort of completely try and ignore the Sons of Durin, surely. I think that is what they're attempting to do, but they're taking damage as they do. And getting a rear action with just one unit isn't going to be enough, I don't think. If those Gwythi Rockdors see them, they're just going to charge downhill and obliterate them pretty quickly. Neuron Halberds moving forward. Bad news for the single unit of Ironfoot Warriors, because at this point they will get overrun. That armor-piercing phalanx against a singular unit of Northern Lion Infantry is most certainly not what they would have been hoping to face. attacking across here, but if the dwarves sort of wake up and get their units into position, they should still be just fine. I mean, over here, Ironfoot Spears will block the Norad Stormguard. The Stormguard will handily defeat Ironfoot Spears, but you can see there immediately the whistle of crossbows shooting into the Norad Stormguard. Certainly one of the most dangerous units of infantry the attackers have on the field full stop, so you definitely want to be using your crossbow bolts on them if you are able. Meanwhile, unit of course our black guards which has gotten up here i mean i'm surprised they were allowed to get as far as they got to be honest i'm amazed the Imladris player didn't see that unit of black guards coming but either, either way he's fortunate that it wasn't really something a little bit more significant because between his wifey rock door and mirday he'll be absolutely fine dealing with them well, this guard of erebor waiting the elves finishing things off over here the dwarves pushing forward Cranodyne pikemen and berserkers might make things a little bit more complicated for the defenders over here now. We've got axemen moving forward as well to try and offer a little bit of an armor piercing edge to proceedings, but who knows? Cranodyne pikemen might be just the sort of thing to turn the battle around. More Variad warriors. They have any more supporting missile they can use. I mean, this is Castamere's Rangers, very depleted. Which realm enslavers. They're running out of resources over here, the attackers. I think. What they're having to do is just sort of throw everything in and hope that it's enough. I mean, the defenders are not going to have too much left either, but we may be seeing the orcs have to carry the day for their team. Will they be able to do that? I think that arms are routing in the face of one snipe. Well, you know, more than one snipe. But Arthur Day marks on pushing forward. Should be enough to route off the snipe skirmishers unit with the assistance of their missiles. Those were clear projectiles, so. Clearly that is a unit of Dunedain Rangers. Bad news for the attackers. Blackguard of Baradur moving in, but there's no real lines for them to actually pull those through. They're just having to be used as regular combatants. And against something like the Dunedain Troll Slayers, that is not a great thing. There are Nazgul in and amongst them, however, which the Troll Slayers, as good as they are, they will struggle with the Nazgul unless the Nazgul are utterly isolated. There's a heavy concentration of heavy goblin spears over here as well, though. Javelins. Decent volley there into an already depleted unit of pikes. The Drake Broodlings could cause actually some real chaos over here. Not that chaos has been lacking over on this side of the battlefield, but there you can see also missiles coming in and very quickly. Lingering for any length of time in and amongst the pikes has resulted in the Drake Broodlings being absolutely mashed. So I would assume that is... no, actually, it's not that unit. The Glory Seekers, it must have been. Um, trying to make something happen by crossing these bridges, it didn't really work. And of course, now Brotherhood of the Sword in melee, pretty strong. Blacklock Engineers out of ammunition, clearly being used quite well on the hilltop, though. So they're now blocking the progress of this battered remnant of a Kandish, ar Kandish army. Akarondas Legion are moving across. I mean, they're committing more units down here to this uh, bridge defence more than anything else. I think they have run out of crossbows. Because this unit of Ironfoot Spears is fighting alone now, and they will be a bulldoze out of the way between the Storm Guard and the Narinaru Royal Guard. In come the Narinaru Sentinels, both units of upper-end pikemen, the Pranadines, and in particular the Sentinels, but Looking a little bit risky at this point for the defenders, looking like... Well, there goes the Paris general. But it is looking like the attackers could push their way up the hill, be victorious here, move forwards, 
This unit of Blythe and Mirrodain doesn't really do an awful lot at this point, which is a little bit confusing. Some of the decision making from the Enlightenment player in particular has been what I would consider to be questionable. I.e. not good. <laughs> Blythe and still charging around. Nine foot crossbows in melee finishing off what remains of those black guards. More units being committed forward to block the progress of the Naran Iron Royal Guard and the Naran Storm Guard. And there's Iron Foot Pikes as well, so they should be kept at arm's length with the addition of a unit of Dwarven Pikes. But it could be that this fight over here ends up being really significant. Like I said, even if the attackers somehow pull it out of the bag and do force the defenders back from that hilltop position. It's going to be at a pretty high cost. They're going to need reinforcements from elsewhere. Meanwhile, the dwarves have actually sent help over to Arthday. Nine Iron for Axe Throwers, Axe Guard of Erebor as well. So another unit of armor piercing infantry, which is going to be really good for dealing with stuff like these Black Guard of Baradur. Uh, speaking of what's going to be good at dealing with any unit, if they get into a position where the enemy are exposed, it's going to be the Iron for Axe Throwers. But they're taking pretty hefty volleys there from the Arden Iron Shadow Bows. Need to get in position to start using those throwing axes pretty quickly. You can also hear the whistle of crossbow bolts. Dismounted four Nostra Rhine Knights are here. Dismounted Knights of Numinous getting into position. I mean, yes, the Heavy Goblin Spears are armor piercing, but the disparity in terms of quality is huge, so unsurprisingly, support from those Orcish and Goblin ranged units is going to be absolutely vital. The Orcs and Goblins are coming forward in great numbers now. Those dismounted four Nostra Rhine Knights, once again, trying to push their way through to go after the ranged units, but this time around I think it's going to be a bridge too far because the Temple Executioners are going to be there, Ardenine Shadow Bows and Heavy Goblin Crossbows, so continuing to push their way out here to this little area is going to end up being fairly costly for Arthane at this point I think, in particular because of those Goblin Crossbows. This however, could this be where the Gwythi Rock Door really earn their pay? They've been more of a peripheral unit so far, they've done They've not been completely inactive. They haven't really done anything too significant in the battle so far. Now, though, they have the opportunity. The battle's pretty stretched over here. Good opportunity to charge into units like the Temple Executioners, rob the attackers of a bit of that quality. You can see the blue cape to Numinous Gate Guards over here as well, but they're a little bit isolated out here in the middle. The possibility is there for them to get overrun. Another Phalanx unit may be the first to try and do that in the White Uruk Fearmongers. We are into the final 10,000 frames, and it is, I mean, it is, the defenders are winning, but we've seen this turn around in the past very quickly, <coughs> and that would be the concern if stuff like those crossbows can really start to get their teeth into the Arthurine units. A lot of the units that are left for the defenders may be out of ammo skirmishes, so if the quality is not there, they may start to struggle with the Gwythi Mirrodain and the Dragon Slayers of Eric Mithrin coming forward, and that should stabilise things up here. The finest units Rudauer have left to offer. I'm moving to engage them, but probably not going to go all that well for them. I mean, it is mostly Rudauer that are left now, the Tram and Slavers. The Naran Irish Sentinels are the only non Rudauer unit that are left over here, I think, that are in any sort of numbers. And yeah, they're going to polish off what remains of the Elder Anyway, but Customers Rangers shooting directly into their backs as well. Iron Foot Warriors ready to reinforce. Possible as well, so more dwarven numbers to be added to the equation, which should be enough to carry the day. Over here, meanwhile, yeah, the Iron for Pipes have done pretty well. They're just holding the enemy at arms out. It'll take them a long time to win this fight, but they should manage it without any sort of input from anywhere else. Iron for Pikes, Iron for Crossbows together. Alcarondas Legion being kept at arm's length. There goes the Mordor General bisected by a Dunedain Axe. And here we are, Blackback Berserkers moving forward. I mean, a very dangerous unit. These Dunedain Troll Slayers are in fairly short supply at this point. Can they withstand this final flourish from the attackers? If they can, the defenders should win this. There's a good opportunity to charge in. They didn't get their lances down. But they are at least interrupting the Ardenheim Shadow Bows, who at this stage one of the most important units that remain. That unit of Heavy Goblin crossbows still also as well. Ooh, those Heavy Goblins being used as makeshift infantry and routing immediately. The White Earth Fearmongers is looking bad. The Elves are coming over here and I think the defenders have this. This Orcish Assault is going to collapse before it comes to anything. 
And the fact that the elves have felt com comfortable enough to send their out of ammo skirmishers over here as reinforcements to this battle rather than the hill on the other side is very telling, isn't it? I'll take Martin. I mean, a lot of the units that the defenders have left at this point are either very battered infantry or archers of some description that are out of ammo. So they don't have that much gas left in the tank, but they should have enough to see themselves through, I would suggest. A few iron foot pikes, out and iron shadow bows, pulling out their swords and waddling forwards, perhaps into the firing line. Still some elder runaway archers. Are they going to send forward any more reinforcements or are they going to pull back? Well, there goes the Umbar general. The attacking generals at this stage dropping like flies. Iron foot crossbows surrounding the crown of iron pikemen at this point, and as decent as pikemen as they are, as soon as you surround unit you know, pikes like this, you expose their lower stats overall, and that is going to be a real problem for them. Not that they were going to be in a particularly great situation anyway, given the calibre of armor piercing infantry they were going up against. There are some Castamere's Rangers. Rudar Axman, surprisingly, with a bit more longevity against this kind of foe than I would expect from them, but they're surely not going to last all that much longer. In the end, I think this is going to be a tale of quality winning the day. Certain Casimir's Rangers. Yeah, and there they go. The Brudar Axemen finally rout. Ironfoot Warrior is going to push forward. What remains of the Brudar units over here? Scattering to the four winds. And I say, I said over here that they would get the Elder Enway out of the way, but they, the Elder Enway are still alive, just about. I am Ladrus Resilience. Combination of really high melee defense and really high armor the highest overall defensive values that the game has to offer. Well, what have we got going on over here? Hard and I am shadow bows being engaged in close quarters. The trebuchet crew. Maybe a little bit more of desperation settings over here for up and just throwing everything forward, trying to do as much damage as they can. The attackers actually will end up winning over here. will be at a cost. I mean, the God Helium is still here, which is not the easiest unit to bring down, but they still have their blackbacks, so they will be able to do it. They still have a unit of over 100 Heavy Goblin Spears being used to finish off the Trebuchet crew. God Helium are here. Oh, there goes the Brudar General. Bonked on the head by uh, an Elven Hammer. As we see here, yeah, it's closing in. It will end within 10%, regardless of what happens from this point on. The Ladris General falls to the Blackback Berserkers. Wardens of the North are over there, 50 of them. Surprised they haven't been committed to the melee sooner. That may have been enough to finish the battle a little sooner. As it is, though, still trying to use those Iron for Axe Throws. Maybe not the best use of them over on this engagement. They could have been a little bit more decisive than they've ended up being. They are throwing it point blank into the black back, so which is probably the best use for them at this point. They're definitely going to do more damage that way than they would in melee against a unit such as this. Hard Knife Shadowbow is trying to get into a position where they can shoot again. Still the heavy goblin crossbows. Forward come the Wardens of the North, taking hits from the goblin crossbows as they do so. And they will stop the Mordor Rangers from firing. And more than that, they will easily be able to get the better of them in melee. Very accomplished unit indeed. Meanwhile, over here, this fight for the hill. Witchrealm and Slavers, finally. This is going to be the end of the attackers' efforts over here. It's been waning for quite a while at this point, but the defenders will finally claim victory. So defending from the front with that quality. And clearly they utilise their ranged fire well. They didn't dump it all early. Early doors into the weakest of the attacking units. They rationed it out well and then obviously their upfront strength the infantry power that you're going to have with an elven and a dwarven faction acting in tandem on the front line especially when the elven faction is in Ladrus 
Also, even the range support that you offer, you can Ladra still have pretty decent archers, and then you mix that in with Erebor's crossbows, and you have clearly a recipe for success. Casimir's rangers are probably racked up a fairly decent kill count for themselves at this stage. Probably need to get some units into them. There are the Illuminous Gate Guards routing, running for the hills. The Dragon Slayers is where the Dwarven General is currently posted. One Witch Realm Enslaver remains. Surely this is going to be the end of him. Taking quite a few hits there from the Gwyth and Day. Decent chunk of damage still coming in from those Castamere's Rangers. What have we here? One to the north still doing their thing. Defeat seems certain. Again, the Black Backs, another in, another good scout for them, helping kill off the God Helene. The dismounted Knights of Luminous are now the Wounds of the North, but all of these high-profile targets have taken their toll. They're all bloodied up. There's only 23 of them that remain. Still heavy goblin crossbows left alive, but I have crossbows on the way forward, just throwing more units in. Customers, Rangers, they're not going to run, which is good. Kiting at this point serves no purpose other than to annoy your opponent. <laughs> and there's no need for such things. And after a charge from the Gwaiti Mirrodain, surely that's going to be enough to finish the Castamere's Rangers in double quick time. Although perhaps not, they would set that charge pretty well. High melee defensive Rangers perhaps coming into play there. Piercing not going to be all that useful against this class of unit either. That's just about it. I have crossbows heading off. More on that in just a moment. And now, heavy goblin crossbows. There are still Nazgul in there, five of them. And as you know, heavy iron but crossbows have been utterly surrounded. The good thing about this is they will kill off a few of the heavy goblin crossbows in melee. Like, Depriving the attackers of a few more of their numbers. But, uh. And there go the Rangers. I don't think there's anything left over here. Yeah, just routing units that are routing alongside one another. Ironfoot pikes moving. Finishing off those heavy goblin spears. So, yes, indeed, this is going to be. The final engagement, so we'll go up to times two speed. The Ironfoot crossbows lasting pretty well, that dwarven armor serving them nicely. Now they're going to lurch forward. I mean, they still have stuff like Dragon Slayer, still quite familiar. I mean, I suppose it's not beyond the realms of possibility, but look at this. Difference of 7%. Only 1% of the Orcish army remains, which is this. They still have some Goblin King's bodyguard, it'll be only three of them. Goes to show how large, like, this is 1%. Times this by 100, and that was the whole evil army. So it was a, certainly a, a significant force that the defenders have managed to repulse from Tolpalas. And Tolpalas is actually a map where very often we see the attackers win a 5v3. So here, that quality really has shown what it's all about. I mean, most of what's left is arable at this point. And you have that one unit of white and mirror from Ladras. There's not really anything left of uh, Arthur Day. They did throw themselves on the line. And I suppose you can say that about the Orcs. Like, they very narrowly managed to defeat Arthur Day, but it's not going to be enough for them to win the battle as a whole, surely. Here we go, Ironfoot crossbows moving in. I mean, the fact they still have pikes is fairly significant as well. Ironfoot Pike's going to be able to keep stuff like the Black Backs and the Nazgul and the very few Goblin King's bodyguard at arm's length. Hmm. Whatever happens to the Dragon Slayers? Are they on their way over as we speak? I would assume so. Even so, it's a fairly decent glut of Ironfoot units, which may actually be enough to handle business on their own given the fact that pikes are among their number and that will prevent units like the black blacks from getting really in and amongst them and causing the kind of damage they would like. So 
actually there are some Blackhawk engineers in here as well, so there is something with a little bit of extra. Although they they themselves have probably also been involved in some pretty elongated melee combat. And here come the Dragon Slayers. That's going to be surely the end of proceedings as we enter the final thousand frames. There goes the Misty Mountains General. Warden General putting himself in harm's way, given the kind of units they're going up against, but the Dragon Slayers in the vanguard, as I'm sure they would always want to be. Here come the Gwaiti Mirdane, so the Elves not wanting to be left out here as the battle enters its crescendo. And this has been a fun one. In spite of the my initial worries, given the the events of the grace period, which ultimately won't be on camera. It's the sort of thing which often leads me to believe that the battle's going to be a certain certain way, very grindy, very one note, but that wasn't the case at all. And I'm very glad about that. And there we go. Very well played to the defenders as well. I think that was actually very... Very deserved in the end because they clearly used their skirmishes correctly. They clearly built their front lines well. The one slight exception to that, I would say, is it was quite chaotic the way that Arthur Dane went about their business. It worked out for them in the end, but I feel as though if the attackers, the Orcish attacks, had been a little bit more organised, they could have punished Arthur Dane for that sort of that sort of setup a little bit more so than they did. Um, but again, that's by the by really because they didn't so in the end Arthur Dane was actually able to make that slightly unorthodox method uh, work for them whereas over on the other side maybe a little bit more clear cut in the way that you know the skirmishes were used wisely the front lines were created nicely the attackers had some good ideas they just needed a little bit more support on that push up the hill they needed a few more supporting units they needed to be a little bit more forthright when Can did decide to cross the bridges they needed to do so with more right from the off because that initial assault got mopped up by the Erebor defenders that were waiting for them far too quickly really um, and yeah that was it Rudauer as well in particular are so good as a supporting faction um, they didn't we didn't really get to see their throwing projectiles utilized in the way that they really can be um, and in the end that was a bit of a, a bit of a difference maker but I do think the defenders did play rather well and it's good to see the defenders win in a 5v3 in Tall Flats I don't think we've seen that in a long a long time what did the damage for Kand, seeing as we, even though um, Jan Mumu was the one who sent me the battle replay, we were seeing it from Hrothgar's perspective. Glory Seekers, when they were committed, obviously they got mopped up by the Gwaiti Rock Door incredibly quickly. Nurad Stormguard, decent amount of kills for them, considering they were under crossbow fire and in an engagement which they were never going to come out as the victor of. Um, but yeah, killing off as many Iron Fist as they can, and no units actually breaking 100 kills, so the Stormguard... Very odd Bowman getting 92. That was a good you know, good use of the Candish Bowman as well, but that was stage one of what could have been a successful assault. But after that, attackers spinning their wheels a little bit and the defenders standing firm in the face of all that. So yeah, big thank you to Jen Mumu for sending this one to me. Big thank you to Hrothgar for saving the replay as well. And a big thank you to all of the players for being a part of this battle replay on a map which is fairly classic. And a rainy day on Toll for Lass is what I think is going to be the last battle replay of 2021. I think, based on what I've seen, this one will be coming out on the 29th of December, all being well, um, and the replay that will follow on from that will be on the 1st of January. So this will be ultimately how we sign off 2021 with an old favourite. Um, I'm sure I would have already talked about um, the events of the year and how it's gone and what I intend to do the next year in the Christmas update, which would have been the video prior to this one, so I won't go into too much of what I inevitably would have spoken about there. Um, but yeah, 2021. It's been it's been something. It's been some good parts, but mostly from my perspective, it's been a fairly punishing year. 2022, who knows what that may bring. There's a lot of variability with regards to what could happen there. We'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Um, but yeah, irregardless of that, I hope that you enjoyed this. Um, another replay on Tolf Lass. As for what's coming up soon, there's going to be another replay on another map that we've seen a few times on Merlond, which will be fairly soon. The replay that's coming up directly after this one should be one that's in 
sort of a goblin caverns map, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's got very much a goblin town kind of feel to it, albeit um, a completely new map. Not It isn't actually goblin town, but it's, you know, you'll see. That'll be the next replay that we see. Um, that'll be the one on the 1st of January. Following on from that, there will be another Rise of Mordor top five, which this time will focus on Shock Cavalry. There's a few more bits from Silmarillion that I'll be doing throughout January as well. And of course, um, there's, there's just going to be more Reforged replays as well, which some of which I do have, which I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sure I'll get sent more between um, now and then anyway, because I'm recording this um, in the early stages of December. So um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Big thank you to all the players and to Jen Mumu and Hrothgar in particular. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.